Renewables as a sector is a still small but growing part of the UK's power generation. Bluefield Solar has, over the last eight years or so, grown into a £600 million company. And its latest set of results, interims for the period ending December 2021, show underlying earnings up to £21.4 million from £18.7 million in the prior year. Net asset value, NAV, has risen from 117.12 to 122.96 pence per share, just to give an example as to how the company is performing at the moment. James Armstrong is managing partner at Bluefield Partners and investment advisor of Bluefield Solar Income Fund. James, welcome. It's great to have you back on board today. Great to see you, Jerry. Um, look, I've got to say, first of all, I am an investor in the company. So everything I say, of course, comes from that viewpoint. I'll try and keep it as neutral as possible because I do want to dig deeper into these numbers. Explain what's been going on, because the last six months, the company has grown, hasn't it? So I talked there about the underlying figures, but in fact, if you look at the raw figures, they are, are quite a bit bigger. Yes, we, we've been we've been pretty acquisitive in the uh, actually in the last couple of years, which has seen the asset base grow, um, and then on top of that, where you're seeing on a, a pence per share basis, we've been um, seeing some very significant tailwinds and so benefits for the company because the majority of the revenues are coming from uh, regulated revenues. So almost two thirds of our revenues are regulated and directly linked to RPI. So we are a net beneficiary of inflation. And then the balance of the revenues is we sell electricity. Um, and the, pr the prices that we have been striking have been significantly higher than they have been in previous uh, periods. And so putting those two things together um, is creating, first of all, a very, very strong set of results uh, that we announced this morning. So we have um, NAV increase of six pence. So we've gone to our highest ever NAV, which is 123 pence per share. And we've given uh, guidance from the board that we're going to improve and, and increase the full year dividend. So not less than 8.1 pence per share. So up from 8.12 pence. And that's because of the strength of the earnings that we can already see. And I should add that the movement in terms of inflation and our power contracts is only just beginning to be felt in the earnings. And we will see some very significant uh, additional growth in the coming months, so for the rest of the financial period, and then in, in the financial periods beyond. Just to explain where your power goes, because you, you get it in from a, a mix, don't you, of solar, and I think wind is coming on, yep. on, on as well. Um, just explain what happens then to it. Who are the off-takers? Who, who purchases the power from you? So you have, yeah, you're absolutely right. So th there are two, so two revenue streams which typically get sold, packaged up and sold together. And we, we focus on relatively short-term contracts, which would be um, one to three-year three contracts for the sale of the power. And then for the two-thirds of the revenues that we have, we have mentioned before that we have uh, what are called renewable obligation certificates. Th those are... Uh, at outset, they are 20-year RPI-linked revenue streams. But when we sell the electricity, um, we're selling it to the very large acquirers of um, wholesale electricity. So we're literally take, putting that onto the grid. So we have, just to imagine what the, the, the majority of our portfolio is, it's a, we have about 2,500 acres across about 100 solar farms. And they're the agriculturally situated solar farms. So they're the very large solar farms that you might see on the edge of a motorway or on a you know, railway uh, line. And uh, what we're doing is we're exporting that electricity to the grid and it's being taken through forward contracts um, by some of the very large wholesale, you know, so the people like EDF or Statcraft or um, people like Lime Jump, which is part of Shell. So all those big, um, well, um, well capitalized uh, businesses. Mm. Do, do you have a cap on what you can charge, or do you just charge at the prevailing rate that it, the that they sell onto the market in too? So, so we're we're selling typically at the short end of the of the um, energy curve. So we have focused on. I mean, the, the purpose of the fund, Jeremy, is to give stable, growing dividends for investors, of which we've been extremely successful. So we've got the highest performing fund of its kind for almost a decade now. Uh, we have the highest earnings and highest dividend per share. We've had that consistently for since we IPO'd in 2013. And um, what, um, what we typically do for the sale of the power is we look to focus on the short end of the market. So you're looking at one to 36 months. Um, or, and you, you've got that sort of, and that's where you can capture as much of the forward um, curve uh, as possible. And, and what we're seeing um, is that there have been the 
the value we announced this morning. So at the end of June 2021, which was our full year um, uh, for the previous full year, the average weighted power price we achieved uh, was just under £50. It's £49 per megawatt hour. If you take the contracts which were struck and started in uh, January 2022, it was almost £90. If you then project forward, <laughs> and we've got about 150 megawatts, we have about 25% of our portfolio which we need to restrike in the next 12 months. If you look where the markets are today and where they are actually expected to be, uh, and this is not uh, accounting for any other sort of uh, background noise in the energy yeah. markets, um, you're looking at prices which will be in excess of that. So there's a very, uh, whilst the performance today has been very good that we've announced, the expectation of earnings and revenue growth going forward is very significant. Mm. One of the things I think that's happened, if I'm right in saying over the last six months, has been this placing, hasn't there? The, you've yeah. been expanding the balance sheet. You've been very acquisitive as well, haven't you? Yeah. Uh, it, it, how has all that gone? And how has you bring new um, business onto the, onto the company all the time? How is that integrating? Is that integrating well? Are you happy with how things have moved? Yeah, very much so. I, mean, I, I think we have the benefit of being now a very well-established investment company that has um, the service providers, which are Bluefields um, service companies. We have over 85 people focused on this fund who are doing day-to-day -day working on the integration and the optimization of new acquisitions. And so in, in terms of where you're looking at bringing on, you know, we did, a, we did our maiden wind uh, acquisition, which was called Project Gladiator. It was 109 single stick turbines. We have the capability. That was a fantastic deal for us. That, that deal looks, um, it looked great at the time. It now looks very, very, very good um, because uh, it's gotten over 90% regulated revenues, which are um, linked to RPI. And so that's in terms of our assumptions at the time, um, the, the actual reality has been significantly better. But we have a team of both technical monitoring and operational professionals who have the ability to make sure we can embed those assets going in. And that's the, we are, you know, we are very, very, uh, we've built up over the past nine years, one of the most experienced and one of the best operational teams that you can see in the market. And that uh, is reflected in the high performance, the consistent high performance of the fund. Mm. My understanding is now, I think it's, 75% solar, is that right? And 25% yeah. non-solar. And that 25% is actually split up between, what, wind and, and also new battery technology, which I believe you're getting into as well. That's right, yeah. I mean, we, we have, when thinking about defensive yield, we are primary, you know, the first place you go for us is solar. That's why it's 75%. And that's why it's called the Bluefield Solar Income Fund. But when looking at delivering attractive risk-adjusted returns. Uh, two years ago, we went to the shareholders and we broadened the mandate to include in that 25% uh, wind and storage because they're very, wind is very complementary to solar. So complementary, it's on a risk-adjusted basis, it is um, the closest you can get to solar. Uh, its generation profile is complementary. It tends to be windy when it's not sunny and vice versa. It's not perfect, but that it kind of, there is quite a good inverse relationship. Geographically, it tends to be um, complementary, and you can also get very high levels, as with uh, Project Gladiator, you can get very high levels of regulated revenues. So for us, it fits very well. If you then look at um, why we looked at storage, is the only forecast, we've said this to you before, and when we've spoken previous, Jeremy, the only forecast we made in the markets is that, um, is that the energy markets are going to become more volatile over the next decade or so, and we're seeing this now, because of um, the fact that your de decarbonisation is going to force baseload, stable baseload, off the energy system that's being replaced by intermittent generation. And that creates volatility. And storage not only is very important to the renewable sector because you need storage to create what could be the proxy for baseload because mm -hmm. it's going to be able to store the energy you're producing, but it's also, it works very, very well in a more volatile energy conditions, energy market conditions. And so it for us, it's when you look at the returns you can achieve in storage and the, and the durability of those returns, because we need a lot of storage in the UK, um, as part of a, a stable uh, defensive base load, um, or I call it base load, but uh, energy load of portfolio of solar and wind, it fits very, very well uh, as a complement uh, to those defensive assets. 
Now, I know you're not an engineer, but I'd like to ask a little bit about what's coming on board and how the industry is developing, because we've just had one of the worst storms. In fact, there were three storms, I think, in quick succession over the UK in the last uh, three or four days or so. And I was alarmed to see that some of these big wind turbines were not operating in these winds. Now, you hear about the fact that it's just too windy. My understanding is, is that there's now a short stick um, wind turbines. Is that right? And I think Bluefield Solar is getting into that. Is that right? Does, yeah. that, does that enable companies to generate wind power, renewable energy during heavy winds? Because it is frightening to see all these this technology not working when it should be, or when the, uh, you know, perhaps maybe the person that doesn't know too much about it thinks it should be working. Well, yeah, I mean, I, all, I mean, in fact, all turbines do have the same issue in very extreme weather. And I think one shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we faced three storms back to back in a week. And, and certainly, you know, going forward, there's going to be the expectation that technology evolves to be able to um, make um, turbines be able to operate more effectively in more extreme weather conditions. But generally, I mean, I think what, what you know, I mean, but overall, I'd say I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't focus too much on that because that's just an extreme, an extreme sort of, of result. And you will see in the slightly milder, um, the slightly milder weather conditions, uh, wind was producing something like 40% of the UK's mm. um, uh, electricity. So there, there's a very good story there. Uh, but, but I have to say, we are told by climatologists that we should expect more of these. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think it's, it is it is incumbent, I think, on, on, on the engineering community to come up with something a little bit more efficient, perhaps, maybe in, in those extreme conditions. Yeah, and I think also that's where you look at a, a balanced portfolio. So if you, the, one of the, another consequence of you going down that sort of where people are trying to forecast what's going to happen yeah. to weather events is that, one of the other areas, obviously, is that the um, increases in temperatures um, throughout summer months as well. And yep, that's something of where, of course, the portfolio, we will benefit from that, uh, although we don't factor that into any, any valuation. Yeah. Um, these interims, of course, went up to the end of December. Uh, we're now fairly well into the second half of the year. How are things developing? Yeah, I mean, we are very, very well placed, Jeremy. I, I, as I said a few moments ago, I think the, the exciting thing for the company is that we have now very significant tailwinds, which are you know, the, the benefit for the business of inflation, the benefit of, the, uh, of much higher power prices, which just isn't being really seen yet in the earnings. And then on top of that, we have, with the, the 80 odd people I mentioned, there is a, a series of strategies which are being undertaken so would be um, where we're looking at uh, you know development opportunities where we've got repowering opportunities you've got our PPA strategy just to give you an example we have consistently outperformed the power forecasters upon which mm -hmm. the basis of most of the valuations in the in our sector are based um, and the the power contracts we've recently we, which is a point in case the power contracts that we have very recently uh, agreed are way ahead of those yeah. uh, contracts. So all in all, there are very significant uh, upside opportunities which are going to be fed into the company over the, let's say, for the rest of the financial year and then beyond. Mm. What I want to do now is to bring up a share price chart because I think it's look, uh, worth looking at this in the context of the lows that we had. You can see on the left-hand side of this chart yep. going back to the COVID lows that we had uh, just over, was that 105, 106 pence? Here we are now trading at 122.65. In the context of what you've just been saying about this second half of the year, what are investors buying into at these levels? And I think one of the highlights, obviously, to this in terms of rewards has to be the point you mentioned about uh, dividends. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. So the, the, just looking at that chart, the sector generally, there, it, there was a little bit of softening of, of prices, which you can see even um, post-COVID. And, and that was really a function of the uh, expectations of both inflation and power markets. And then, and so that's really caused that kind of, that sort of softening. And yet today, when you look at where we are, we have... A, a market where all of those factors was turned around and now looking favorable for a fund like Bluefield Solar. So you've got, you know, high benefit, as I said, benefit of higher inflation, you've got the benefit of significantly higher power prices. And what we're, you know, we have a dividend yield today, uh, based on actually the closing price yesterday of 6.7% dividend yield, based on, a, on the, the forward guidance of a, a dividend of 8.16 pence per share. And 
when you consider that you know there's no currency risk, you've got majority of revenues are you know two thirds are regulated directly RPI RPI linked, very defensive asset base. That is, you know, it looks a very, a very attractive yield, and we think there is definitely the potential for upside there in terms of the, the share price. One final question I have to ask, and that is about the, the background, the energy prices, the inflation, and so forth, and what we're seeing, and of course, what's happening at the moment in Ukraine with, with regard Russia. How does this play into the appeal for renewables? Gosh, Jeremy, yes, it's a big, well, that you should probably get, um, um, you, others could answer the geopolitical of uh, question, but I think in terms of energy, I think if you're looking at it through the um, through the the lens of a fund like Bluefield, which is UK only, um, and you know having very defensive revenues, it is a it's an attractive option because one of the the consequences one would think of what is going on over there is going to be that it's going to further dislocation of the energy markets. Uh, and that's probably going to be inflationary, uh, one would expect. And But you know, taking a step back, when you look at defensive income, something like Bluefield Solar is going to, you know, is going to be very attractive in those environments. So um, whilst you obviously hope that doesn't happen for lots of reasons, if you're thinking of about course. through the myopic view of Bluefield Solar, um, then it's likely to be a net beneficiary. Yeah. Okay. Look, James, I have to leave it there. But thank you so much indeed uh, for joining us. It's been a pleasure catching up with you. As I said, I have to uh, declare my interest as a, an investor in Bluefield Solar. James Armstrong is managing partner of Bluefield Partners and investment advisor of the Bluefield Solar Income Fund. For more videos from us here at IGTV, join us on Twitter at IGCom, Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel.